Okay, so I'm going to talk about the fundamentals of global warming. I'm going to introduce you to the glacial interglacial cycles that the Earth has gone through through the last half million years and show how that's relevant with regard to greenhouse gases. Um, I'll talk quite a bit about the changes in the greenhouse gas concentrations that we've seen over the last 150 years. And then I'll introduce climate models and show how they are used to uh, uh, document our understanding and project things into the future. Um, all of the figures that I'm going to use in this talk, well, one exception, are from uh, a report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And I want to talk about that group for a moment. This is a group of experts, scientists, and diplomats that are charged by the United Nations with dealing with the important problems that we face in climate change. Um, they deal both with science and with policy. And uh, so you'll see figures uh, in my talk and uh, will other speakers today will be referring to some of the results that this group has uh, presented. This is a fairly complicated figure that shows gas concentrations over time. So the time scale goes from 700,000 years ago to the present. Uh, data for the amount of gases of various types have been derived, uh, measured in bubbles in the ice, in Arctic ice, Arctic and Antarctic ice cores. So the middle two curves, the red curve and the blue curve, show the amount of carbon dioxide in red and methane in blue. Those are important greenhouse gases over time. You see them going down and up, down and up. There are gray bands. Those indicate, indi indicate interglacial periods, periods like now when the Earth is warm. Most of the time in the last half million years was spent in glacial conditions. Um, we'll continue with this figure. So the, the gas concentrations vary over periods of thousands of years. The, the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide and methane, are high the concentrations are high during interglacial periods, like now, and they're low during glacial periods. The oxygen isotope data, the bottom curve, gives us a way to calibrate how much ice there is on the Earth and how much the temperature varies. There's a temperature scale there that goes from over a range of 16 degrees Fahrenheit, pretty substantial change between glacial and interglacial times. We're in one of those brief interglacial periods now. The gas concentrations are high. It's not a coincidence. Here's the most more recent data, uh, extending over the last couple thousand years, so 2,000 years ago until present. The data on the left half of this figure, or left three quarters of the figure, are also from ice cores. Carbon dioxide at the top, methane at the bottom. The range that those gases varied during the glacial, interglacial cycling is shown by these gray bands. More recent observations are shown in the spike at the right of carbon dioxide and methane. Those are instrumental observations, direct observations in the atmosphere. We're completely out of range. The concentrations of those gases are much higher now than they were during the last half million years. So we're disrupting the cycle between glacial and interglacial conditions that was present before. This is a summary of the impacts of those changes on the environment. So the different bars show different aspects of change. Almost all of these changes are anthropogenic changes, changes made by us, by the hand of man. The gases are shown in the two bars at the top. In the middle are uh, particulate aer aerosols, particulates in atmospheres, changes in land use, things like that. Solar radiance is down here. So the top two bars show the four primary types of man-made greenhouse gases. Uh, the middle bar here shows land use changes. That's a cooling effect. The gases are heating the atmosphere, but it's red, they're positive numbers, heating. The negative values are cooling. Uh, an example of a land use change is clearing of a forest. Um, the, the clearing of forests and other land use changes we've made have, have cooled the environment slightly over the last 150 years. Aerosols are also a cooling effect. These are anthropogenic aerosols, smoke, dust, and haze from things that we've done. Those cool the environment slightly. Sometimes you hear people say, oh, climate change is caused by solar cycles. These are the best estimates of the forcing of changes in the environment because of solar cycles during the last 150 years. It's a tiny amount, and it's smaller than the uncertainty. So if you add all these effects up, the heating, Take away the cooling, 
we have a positive effect. We've had warming over the last 150 years. This is another way of looking at the global heat budget. This is a, a budget adding up all of the sources of heat, all of the ways in which the atmosphere and Earth can cool themselves. Solar radiation is shown on the left-hand side. Infrared radiation, or heat energy, is shown on the right-hand side. Solar radiation comes in. Most of it reaches the surface of the Earth, but some of it is reflected back out. That's accounted for on the left. On the right-hand side, we're talking about heat energy that's entering and leaving the atmosphere, some of it from the surface of the Earth itself, some from other sources. Greenhouse gases warm the atmosphere. That's a natural process which we've enhanced by adding these anthropogenic greenhouse gases. Heat energy is emitted from the surface of the Earth. Um, the, the Earth is radiating its heat away, just as any warm object does. But most of that energy is absorbed in the atmosphere, and a lot of it is reflected back, so only a small amount escapes to space. That's how the Earth stays at a relatively steady temperature. The fact that these two bars indicate nearly equal amounts means that the atmosphere is in balance with heat sources and with its own cooling. Because we've increased the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the ability of the atmosphere to cool itself has been reduced, and we've had a warming tendency. That warming tendency is shown here by surface observations. These are annual average land surface temperature observations taken at weather stations and other such locations over the last 150 years. The individual black bars indicate the annual average of the land surface temperature. Uh, and you see curves that are smoothed variations over time. And what you see is a, a warming trend, particularly in recent years. These data end in 2003, but as you know, the, the trend has continued. Now, when we go to come to a complete understanding of all of this stuff, we use not only direct observations, but simulations. Simulations are mathematical models that allow us to test our understanding of these processes and then to make a projection into the future. So I want to talk about climate models in that context. Climate models are numerical, mathematical models in which we do calculations on tendencies. The most significant physical processes that we understand are included, and when we think of a new process that might be having an impact, we test our understanding of that by putting it into a model. There are multiple models, different groups maintain different models that use different mathematical approaches or different ways of estimating the processes. And those different approaches then can be, again, used to understand, to test our understanding of how well we comprehend what's going on. When we do this, um, the first thing we do is compare with weather that has already happened, with conditions that we have documented. So we do a simulation for the year 2000 and see how it matches with what we saw in the year 2000. Because computer power has increased so dramatically over the last few decades, we can now do simulations that extend over decades, tens of years, even you'll see a century-long simulation in a minute. It's amazing capability that we have and that allows us to explore multiple processes. And in particular, when we're using these climate models, we can exclude a process for a test and then put it back in in another test and, and see what the effects of different processes are. So this shows two sets of simulations. I want to focus your attention first on the bottom graph and then we'll go to the top graph. The bottom graph um, shows simulation results in blue. The observations in black here, that's the temperature over time. This is 1900 to the year 2000. Those observation data are, in the, are the same in both of these graphs. But in this bottom graph, they did an experiment with multiple models in which they kept the greenhouse gas concentrations constant. They didn't allow the greenhouse gas concentrations to rise. That's, that's a, a hypothetical situation. And what they see is that the atmosphere did not warm very much over that century in that situation. So the models say, if you don't include the greenhouse gases, the atmosphere didn't warm, or wouldn't have warmed. When we do the same calculation using the more realistic situation of putting in the greenhouse gases, we see the temperature rise as it has in nature. So you see in the upper curve, the yellow band matches the observations much more directly. When we do these simulations, we include all the other natural effects. So these 
vertical bars indicate the eruptions of major volcanoes. Volcanoes spew sulfate into the atmosphere that acts to cool the planet for a moment, for, for a short period of time, a moment, a year or two, and we see those cooling events associated with those volcanoes. This kind of comparison, thank you, this kind of comparison indicates that we've got to include the greenhouse gases, and that means that the greenhouse gases are in fact the changing greenhouse gases, that's the source of the warming that we've observed. Okay, so shift away from models for a moment and talk about additional observations. And these are trends, things that we've seen happening, changing, things happening more often. Ar Arctic ice has melted during the summer for millions of years. But in recent years, the Arctic ice melting in the summer has become more intense. There's been less and less ice at the end of the summer year after year after year. Um, this means that we can now get to the Arctic in the summertime and we'll be able to drill for oil and gas there. We'll be able to, f to exploit populations of fish that are present in the Arctic. There's serious implications for those developments. Of course, it's good for the stockholders of the oil company that drills for the gas there, but uh, the impacts on global warming is, is not going to be um, a melting of Arctic ice, in particular the ice on Greenland, has been increasing and in fact is accelerating. The amount of ice melt that has occurred has gotten greater each year, so it gets greater, then greater still, greater still. The, the melting is accelerating. This is a troubling thing, and you'll hear talk about the impact on sea level rise when John Boothroyd gets up to talk. Um, tundra, the frozen soil in the Arctic, has huge amounts of greenhouse gases embedded in the soil itself. As the tundra warms and begins to melt, those gases are released. These are not good, good things. Now, the ocean's heat content is increasing because of the warming that I've talked about. The ocean heat content is a, is a critical measure of the ability of tropical storms to develop. When Isaac talks, you're going to hear about the implications of increasing ocean heat content on tropical storms. Droughts are a damaging effect on the environment. Their frequency and intensities have been increasing. Record high temperatures observed at a, at a weather station. It, it, every, every day on the news you hear the temperature, the high temperature for this date was, you know, in 1947. Record high temperatures have become more common Record low temperatures have become less common. High temperature records are three times more common than low temperature records in recent years. Mid-latitude storm tracks and climate zones are shifting towards the poles. Floods have become more frequent, more frequent and more intense, just as have droughts. Ocean acidification is a, a effect that's part of the change in the carbon budget, and that's having a bad impact on fishes, on coral reefs, and other marine resources. Back to simulations for a short time. These are simulations using scenarios. So the time scale goes here from 1900 to 2300. The present time is about here. So we're going to focus our attention mostly on this upcoming century. We see that the temperature has increased. Again, this is global average temperature. Temperature has increased a bit during the last century. And we expect it to continue increasing. By how much? Let's think about that using simulations, using models. If we, if we construct a model in which we cut off greenhouse gas emissions, listen carefully, I didn't say cut off increases in greenhouse gas emissions. Let's pretend that we could cut off all greenhouse gas emissions right now. No more carbon dioxide from burning. No more uh, release of carbon dioxide from the tundra. All of that, cut that all off. This is how the temperature would increase over the next century. That's not going to happen. That's physically impossible, except in our imagination. But we can use various approaches to saying, how is society going to respond to these uh, challenges that we have? How is nature going to interact with those changes? So we've, they've done a number of different scenarios. We see that the warming is increasing, and in most of the simulations, the warming is accelerating. That is, these curves are concave upward. 
meaning that the rate of increase of the temperature is going up. That's not a good thing. Only if we take drastic action, I don't have time to, to explain <coughs> what's involved in these different scenarios, but to a crude approximation, you can think of this red line as indicating something close, close to business as usual. The risk of offending you, I would say that would be the Rick Perry model, <laughs> okay, or the Rick Perry approach. My dad would have loved it. My, my dad, bless his heart, and may he rest in peace, would have been you know, pretty happy with that pro-business approach. The temperatures are going to get to a really high level, and the environmental impacts are going to be very, very severe. Um, only if we take drastic action does the rate of temperature increase slow down, and it doesn't slow down until a hundred years from now. These are serious problems. So I would say, I would ask you to note this Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, from whom I got all these figures, this is not only a group of people, it's a process, and the process is ongoing. Uh, those people are working right now to prepare their next report. The next report will be released in 2013. <coughs> um, so we'll, we'll get renewed information from them, updated information. But I have to add this caution. I've talked about greenhouse gases as being an important part of this global warming phenomenon. Emissions of greenhouse gases are what we try and control when we put on a, a limit of some kind. So if we do carbon trading, or if we put a huge tax on carbon. Those are the kinds of things that you hear about as proposals for lessening our uh, impact on the environment. We're trying to lessen emissions. In fact, even in the face of attempts to curtail emissions, the emissions of greenhouse gases have always exceeded the target amounts in every country at every time. It's bad news. Uh, I don't know how to fit behavior change into this, but we have not succeeded at controlling emissions of greenhouse gases. Scientists are by nature cautious people. We don't, we don't overstate things. If you ask me, is it 925, I'll check my watch carefully before I agree to that. That's how scientists talk. Cautious scientists are now saying that there are going to be serious impacts, quote, with virtual certainty. That's, that's an important kind of statement. So that's my summary of climate change, and that's all I wanted to say. Thank you.